الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على نبينا محمد وعلى آله وأصحابه أجمعين ما بعد. We continue our reading in the great treaties, Akhlaq, Hamlet al Quran, by Al Imam Abu Bakr Muhammad ibn al Hussein al Ajuri, Rahimahullah Taala, the great scholar of hadith and imam in the sunnah akhlaq hamalat al-Qur'an and his treaties, the manners of the carriers of the Qur'an we have begun reading in the chapter the author has entitled Bab Babu akhlaq al-mukri'i idha jalasa yukri'u idha jalasa yukri'u li wajhillahi azza wa jal madha yanbagi lahu an yatakhalaqa bih the chapter which the author has entitled the manners, the etiquettes of the teacher of the Qur'an whenever he sits to teach for the face of Allah and for the sake of Allah alone seeking the pleasure and the reward from Allah جل, seeking the face of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to see him in the hereafter the manners of this teacher whenever he sits to teach for the sake of Allah alone مَاذَا يَنْبَغِي لَهُمْ يَتَّخَلَّقَ بِهِ what are the manners that is befitting for him to, to abide by and to follow? In our previous class, we have been reading the author. He mentioned from those first manners is that he should be humble to those whom he teaches, and that he should be kind to them. <clears throat> and he should be humble to them and he should not be arrogant and boastful. And likewise the author he mentioned, Rahimahullah Ta'ala, that the fact that this teacher is using these good and noble manners and that he is conducting himself in the best way, in the best way, with the best conduct according to the legislation of Allah Azza wa Jal in the Quran and in the Sunnah with those noble manners that he has learned and studied from the book of Allah and from the sunnah of the messenger وسلم, the fact that he is taking on these manners and he is applying them in his dealings with the people this is an indication of his virtue and likewise it's an indication an indication of his truthfulness of his sidq of his sidq and of the truthfulness this person has in his, with his knowledge that he was seeking this knowledge for the purpose of application until the extent that this knowledge is seen in his in his manners and in his conduct. So the manners and the conduct, <clears throat> this is a sign of the truthfulness of the student that he is striving and he is seeking that knowledge for the sake of Allah in order to draw near to him by applying that knowledge. Here in this case, this is with regards to the teacher. But if the student did not have that intention, then he cannot be a teacher upon that way. Rather first, before the teacher can be upright and upon the good way of the Prophet وسلم, with those good manners, he first has to be like that as a student. Make us for an imam for the mutaqeen. You see the meaning of that, to be a leader for the pious, meaning that one has to follow those pious first. And be a student of those pious and righteous people before. And follow behind them and take them as a role model and example in their manners and their conduct. Before that in their creed and their methodology. And then likewise in their manners and their conduct. And then in this manner a person will be a leader for those after him. For those righteous and people who come after him. Similar like that the, the teacher. Before he's a teacher he must be a student. Nam so he, if the teacher he is abiding by these manners and his conduct and this indication that whenever he was seeking knowledge that he did it sincerely because it's showing, the fruits are now showing in his actions. The fruits are now showing in his speech and in his conduct. And in reality it's something that a believer he must pay attention to that the da'wah is spread with, with good manners. The da'wah, the salafiyah, the sahihah is spread with good manners with good conduct and good dealing with the people. And many times we see that whenever there's a lack of these good manners or a lack of this understanding, it's a reason for the da'wah to, to stop in the tracks for the people to reject the, the correct da'wah. Many people, they sometimes will refuse the advice 
of a person to follow the sunnah, or they will refuse, they will refuse the, the evidence that is presented before them, not because they re- refuse the evidence, but because they refuse the manner that the person presented it. Many times a person, if he's not careful, his conduct and his manners could be a reason to cause somebody to turn away from the truth. That person may be in the words and in his heart he's seeking for the truth, but because somebody dealt with him in a manner that is not correct, in a manner with harshness, where harshness is not, uh, is not the correct uh, manner to use, it's not the right place to be harsh. Harshness has its place, its place, no doubt. But if somebody uses harshness in a time whenever gentleness is required, then this could be a reason for that person to turn away. And many people, they have been turned away from the sunnah, from the layman. Because of the foul actions of, and the foul conduct, and the foul manners of some of uh, the people who ascribe to the Sunnah, and some of the people who ascribe to Salafiyya, because they themselves, in reality, they didn't re- remove the Amiya from themselves. They're still laymen too, and they're still following the manners of the laymen, and they haven't uh, raised themselves first, and they try to call to that good knowledge that they have, but they call it in a manner that is not proper, and they refute the munkar and the evil in a manner that is more evil. And this is not correct. And if the point is that whenever a person he wants to call to Allah Azza wa Jal, he, to be a teacher, yani, to direct somebody to some good, he has to do that in the best manner and in the best way. The way of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Allah had commanded his Prophet, Call to the way of your Lord. How do you call? Bil hikmah, with wisdom. Wal mu'idah, and hasana, and good admonition. Not with harshness, not with belittling, not with uh, the intention to, to lower somebody and to raise one's own rank. Now, so the importance of the teacher, particularly knowing, or the one who's going to call to Allah, Azza wa Jalla, the one even. Who has someone, someone under his care He must be aware of these etiquettes and these manners <clears throat> Here the chapter is about the teacher And this is specific with regards to reciting the Quran And teaching the Quran But we can take the general benefit likewise Because even inside of the home a father He's a teacher Whether he, reali- he realized that or not But the believers they should, they, they should realize that A man he must realize that in his home That his, his children and his wife they learn from him whether he is teaching them directly or indirectly. They learn from his manners and his conduct. Whenever he comes in the house, how does he come in? Whenever he leaves the home, how does he leave? Whenever he speaks to the children, how does he speak? Whenever he speaks to the, the children's mother, how does he deal with her? All of this, the children are learning from that. They're learning from that. So then a believer, he must be aware that he's a qudwa in his home. So to have those best manners is very in those good and beautiful and lofty etiquettes and manners and to discipline himself according to the discipline of the Quran and the Sunnah is very important. It's very important. Even if he's not a memorizer of the whole Quran, for example. But still he has those under his care that he is responsible for. That he is responsible for. Likewise the, the sister, the wife. Likewise the children, they learn. They learn from her and her dealings with her husband. She raised her voice to him. Because if so, then those children, if they're, they're girls, they'll, they'll probably do the same to their husband whenever they grow older because they learn like this. They learn like this from, from experience. This is something that's not pleasing to Allah Azza wa Jalla. So be careful that one would teach their children something that is not pleasing to Allah Azza wa Jalla. Be careful that one would say one thing, follow the sunnah, follow the sunnah, but the actions are teaching the children other than that. And so this is from the benefits of learning. This is specific, as I mentioned, again, akhlaq al-mukri. The manners of, this, of the teacher. The next chapter, the manners of the student. The first chapter or the, chapter, the main chapter that we've been reading about, the, in the akhlaq hamilat al-Qur'an. And every Muslim, he's carrying something from the Qur'an. And every Muslim, he should have a desire in his heart that he will be from those who are the carriers of the Qur'an. And those who are the people of Allah Azza wa Jal. Min ahlillahi wa khasati. Those specific those, one, those servants that are close to Allah That are near to Him That know Him by His names And know Him by His attributes Know Him by His deen Know Him by His commandments and prohibitions Know Him By His creation Subhanahu wa ta'ala 
And this is the greatest favor to be from these people. To know Allah Azza wa Jal. To have a relationship with Him. To have trust and reliance upon Him. To have faith in Him and hope in Him subhanahu wa ta'ala. Great favor from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So a believer, he will try to rectify his self, rectify his manners, rectify his etiquettes, and be a qudwa in his home for his family, and be a qudwa in his job amongst his co-workers, be a qudwa in the masjid for his brothers, or likewise the woman for her sisters. This is the case. In this manner, a believer can obtain much, much benefit in this life and the hereafter by being a good role model and a good example. And everyone who follows him in the khair that he's upon, in the good that he's upon, whether it's from speech or action, or whether it's from dealings or transactions, then he will have a reward from that without decreasing their reward whatsoever. A very famous hadith from the Prophet wasallam, or many actually narrations with regards to this. Hadith. So then a believer, he will strive to rectify his manners. In any case, he will know that the, the issue of etiquette and manners is very important in the deen of Islam. It's very, very important in the life of the Muslim. And it will suffice one narration from Abi Hurairah radiallahu anhu that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he said, إِنَّمَا بُعِثْتُ لِأُتَمِّمَ مَكَارِمَ الْأَخْلَاقِ One narration, مَصَابِحَ الْأَخْلَاقِ Also it has come. That I was only sent, and I was sent, meaning as a messenger and a prophet, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, to complete the perfect manners to complete the moral conduct and the moral character. So the deen, the whole deen is akhlaq. The deen is akhlaq. And the highest akhlaq is with Allah Azza wa Jal. Al-ikhlas was siddiq. Ma'ahu subhanahu wa ta'ala. Fi sirri wal alam. Being truthful with Allah Azza wa Jal. Being truthful with Him and sincere. In, pro- in, pu- in public and in private. Following the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa truthfully in public and in private. In good times and in bad times. In stress and in, and in pleasure. Following him, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, this is the good manners. After that, with the people. According to their status and according to their rank. So the author, he's mentioning the fact, he said, فَيَنْبَغِي لَهُمْ يَسْتَعْمِلَ مِنَ الْأَخْلَاقِ الشَّرِيفَ مَا يَدُولُ عَلَى فَضَلِهِ وَصِدْقِهِ هذه الجملة العظيمة. So this is from the very beginning of the chapter that we read yesterday. It's incumbent for him to use that noble, those noble manners that indicate his virtue and his truthfulness. And his honesty that he was truthful with Allah Azza wa Jal. So this is indication from the author that whenever the person, he learns the deen and he starts to follow those manners and he rectifies himself, this is indication that whenever he's seeking knowledge, he's not doing it for, uh, he ha- he ha- he's not doing it with a corrupt intention, rather he had a good intention. And that's showing whenever the person, he has a good intention, sincerely for the sake of Allah Azza wa Jal, and he makes the effort that is required, then Allah puts barakah in his actions. And he puts barakah in his deeds. So we've seen from those noble manners of the teacher is that he is just with his students. Whether they're poor, destitute, or whether they are wealthy and rich, he, he's just with them. And he, give, he gives each one his right. And he hopes the best for his, his student by directing him to that which is most beneficial first and that which is most important first and teaching him in this manner step by step beginning with the Fatiha and rectifying that which is obligatory for him to be rectified and then after that, that which will help him to pray and to fulfill his obligation of the obligatory prayers the portion of the Quran which he will recite for example the last juz, or that which is a little more than that from the juz Tabarak and the likewise and the likes so he will help him with this. After he had mastered this and he had corrected, he has rectified his tongue with regards to this, then after that he will start with him in Baqarah and in the, in, the, in the bigger chapters and the likes like this. But he will direct the student to that which is most beneficial for him. So this is one of those main goals of that righteous teacher and that pious murabbi that wants good for his student that he won't just let him go here and go there, but rather he will direct him to that which is most beneficial, that which is most important for him. And he will help him to fulfill that obligation first. And then after that, that which is, that which is most important after that. And this is the way of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Whenever he sent Mu'adh ibn Jabal, radiallahu anhu to al-Yaman, he mentioned to him, 
فليكون أول ما تدعوهم إليه أن يوحدوا الله أو إبادة الله أو يشهدوا أن لا إله إلا الله in many different narrations and then if they obey you in that فإن, أطاع... فإن أطاعك لذلك then after that you command them with the salat then you inform them that Allah has made salat obligatory upon them let the first thing that you call them to is shahada let the first thing they call you that you call them to tawheed if they comply in this and they obey in that then tell them about salat and then after that if they comply to that then tell them about zakat so, the, so this is the case that a teacher a caller he will begin that with that which is most important and then that which is most important and so on and so, and so forth in this matter so the author now he mentions he says and he, he continues mentioning the, the etiquette that he's preferring for that student or excuse me for that teacher he says that and also I like for the one who is teaching that if someone is reciting to him that he listens attentively to their recitation he listens attentively to the one who is reciting to him that he is not preoccupied with anything else with any other speech or anything else meaning at the time whenever his student is in front of him and teaching that he will pay attention to him and he will listen attentively to him he says he said because in this manner it's most rightful or most likely that the one who is reciting to him will benefit the most in this manner. And likewise he himself will benefit as well. So it's not for the teacher that whenever the, te- the student is reciting that he's looking at his jawal, he's looking here and looking there. But at the time whenever he's teaching he should pay attention to the student. He should give his attention to the student. As he mentioned before, يُقْبِلُ عَلَى طَالِبِهِ إِقْبَالًا جَمِيلًا That he will face his student in the best manner. And he will be devoted any, into helping him into what he is involved in. And he for the sake of Allah Azza wa Jal. And this is the case too likewise because that student, as the author mentioned, that this is mo, mo, most likely in this manner, بِالْحَرِي أَنْ يَنْتَفِيَ مَنْ يَقْرُوا عَلَيْهِ يعني أكثر, That the one who is reading, he is more likely to benefit in this manner. And not to mention this is in a, in a manner that one should honor that student. Because the student, he could go to another teacher. Or the student, he could, the student first, first and foremost, he has honor with him. Allah has honored him with the Qur'an. And honored him to busy himself with the book of Allah Azza wa Jalla. And then to come to the house of Allah to learn. And then to come to that individual particularly to learn from that teacher. And likewise, the student had spent time before this outside the masjid. Effort, preparing that page or preparing those lines to recite, memorizing them, going through difficulty. And then also there's the, the issue of sitting in front of the teacher. Sometimes a student may, may, be get, may get nervous. And there's all types of things that happen whenever he uh, has to, make the, to recite to his teacher. Sometimes if he's not really prepared, maybe he's nervous. Or if he's really prepared, sometimes things happen and, and he's not able to think properly. The student is going through any difficulty in his, in his education. That's the point. So he's making all this effort and then he comes and he reads to the teacher and the teacher is talking to somebody else. Iqra, go ahead and read. And then he talks to somebody else. He doesn't even listen. How is that going to affect the student? He gave all of this effort, all this time, getting this ready to, to, to recite, hoping that he can recite it properly and pass. And then the teacher doesn't pay him any attention. The teacher is not listening to him, doing something else. So this is not befitting. As for if the, stu- if the, if the teacher, he listens, he listens attentively. To the recitation of the student, the student, then he will also benefit from that. And he will see that my teacher is taking a serious with me. And then I will, I will likewise have to be serious. So he will benefit. And likewise, as he mentioned, the, 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 the teacher himself will benefit. And he will listen to the words of Allah Azza wa Jalla and he will hear them. And he will hear them and he will ponder over the recitation of, of his student. And he will remember Allah Azza wa Jalla and what he is involved in is ibadah. It cannot be performed with heedlessness. And that he is seeking the reward from Allah Azza wa Jal. So he must present it in the best manner. In Allah katab al ihsana fi kulli shay. Allah has written perfection al ihsan in everything. Especially in teaching his book. Especially in teaching his book. Especially in listening to his words being recited. Naam? So this is the case. Fa bil hari, he says, an yantafi abihi man yakra'u alayhi wa kada yantafi'u huwa aywan. So it's most likely or more likely. And rightful that this, in this manner, the student who is re- reading to him will benefit. 
and likewise he himself will benefit. He said, ma yasma'u min ghayrihi, that he ponders over what he hears from other than him. And he ponders over the recitation of others whenever it's recited in his, in his presence. And this is a teacher, so he busies himself listening to the recitation of others. And this is, this is what he does. He listens to the recitation of others in order to help them and correct them. So, whenever he's listening, he's listening with tadabbur. He's pondering, trying to understand, taking advantage of his time. He's teaching, yes, he wants to help. Also, he wants to benefit himself. These are the words of his Lord being recited. So then he will listen as is required attentively and try to ponder and understand. He said, وَرُبَّمَا كَانَ السَّمَاعُهُ لِلْقُرْآنِ مِنْ غَيْرِهِ لَهُ فِيهِ زِيَادُتُ مَنْفَعَةٍ وَأَجْرٌ عَظِيمٌ He said, and possibly, or it could be that the fact that he's listening to the Qur'an from somebody else, and he, meaning that it's being recited to him, and he's hearing it from somebody else, then this could bring a, an extra benefit that he did not have before. Or this could be, likewise, he could have a greater reward. Sometimes when an individual, he himself is busy with the recitation, maybe he is, sometimes he will focus on the pronunciation and not concentrate on the meaning as much as he should. As much as he should. Or maybe he's trying to concentrate on remembering the next verse. Or in you know, the lights like this. Sometimes a person, whenever he himself is reciting, he doesn't get to fully make tadabbuh as is, uh, he would like to. But whenever he hears a recital from somebody else, his mind is free. And it's clear and he can listen and can focus. So maybe he'll get an extra benefit from listening to another person recite. From listening to another person recite, he might also obtain a greater reward. He said, meaning that he will try to understand and apply. He will try to understand and apply the statement of Allah That he would ponder over these words, the words of Allah the meaning of which is, and whenever the Quran is recited, then be quiet, then be, uh, then listen, excuse me, then listen attentively and be silent. So that you can obtain mercy. So that you can obtain mercy. So then whenever the Qur'an is being recited from his student, then he will try to apply this verse. And he will remember this verse whenever the Qur'an is recited, like at that time whenever he's teaching. Then he should listen attentively. فَاسْتَمِعُوا لَهُ وَأَنْسِتُوا And be silent. And he be silent. And he, with the voice also be silent in the heart and pay attention and listen attentively. And pay attention and listen attentively. لَعَلَّكُمْ تُرْحَمُونَ In order for you to obtain mercy. So then he will listen to that recitation of his student, hoping to benefit his student, seeking that reward. And likewise, hoping for himself to benefit and to obtain the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Numerous benefits that he will get from, from this gathering. From this gathering. If he is sincere and if he follows the proper conduct and manners and etiquettes in his teaching. He said, فَإِذَا لَمْ يَتَحَدَّثْ مَا أَغَيْدِهِ وَأَنْ صَطَى وَأَنْ صَطَى إِلَيْهِ أَدْرَكَتْهُ الرَّحْمَةُ مِنَ اللَّهِ سُبْحَانَهُ وَكَانَ أَنْفَأَ لِلْقَارِئِ عَلَيْهِ وَقَدْ قَالَ النَّبِي صلى الله عليه وسلم لعبد الله بن مسعود رضي الله عنه اقرأ عليه قال قلت يا رسول الله اقرأ عليك وعليك أنزل قال إني أحب أن أسمعه من غيري He mentioned here رحمه الله تعالى He said if he did not listen, excuse me, if he, if he did not speak, meaning he was silent. He didn't speak to anyone else and he was, he was silent during the recitation of the words of Allah Azza wa Jal, during the recitation of the Qur'an, then the mercy of Allah, he will obtain that. And this is the meaning of the verse. Whenever the Qur'an is recited, then listen to it attentively and be silent. And the reason for that, so that you can obtain mercy from Allah. So then he would do this, hoping to have uh, this virtue and obtain the mercy from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And likewise, in this manner, the author he says this it will be more beneficial for the for the reciter. It will be more beneficial for the reciter in this manner. And and likewise, the Prophet وسلم, he said to Abdullah bin Mas'ud, radiallahu anhu, he told him, he said, Recite to me. The Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he told Abdullah ibn Mas'ud, he said, recite to me. Abdullah ibn Mas'ud radiallahu anhu, he said, should I, O Messenger of Allah, 
Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, should I recite to you and it was revealed to you? I should recite to you and it was revealed to you? The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he said, Verily, I like to hear it recited from other than me. I like to hear and the, the, the Quran recited from others, from others besides myself, from others besides myself. The author, he mentioned a chain of narration with regards to this, with his chain to Ibn Mas'ud and radiyallahu anhu. Then he said, قَالَ لِي رَسُولُ اللَّهِ صَلَى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَّمُ اِقْرَأْ عَلَيَّ فَقُلْتُ أَقْرَأْ وَعَلَيْكَ وَعَلَيْكَ أُنزِلْ قَالَ أُحِبُّ وَنْ أَسْمَعَهُ مِنْ غَيْرِي قَالَ فَافْتَحْتُ سُورَةَ النِّسَاء فَلَمَّا بَلَقْتُ فَكَيْفَ إِذَا جِئْنَا مِنْ كُلِّ أُمَّةٍ بِشَهِيدٍ جِئْنَا بِكَ عَلَى هَؤُلَاءِ الشَّهِيدَ قال فرأيت عينيه تذرفان فقال لي حسبك فقال لي حسبك This is a narration that is authentic on the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم in Bukhari Muslim that the Messenger صلى الله عليه وسلم he told Abdullah bin Masood, he said, recite to me. And Abdullah bin Masood, not to mention the Prophet ﷺ, he praised the recitation of Abdullah bin Masood. And whoever would like to learn the Qur'an, غَضًا طَرِيًّا كَمَا أُنزِلْ Whoever would like to learn the Qur'an proper, in the manner that it was, it was, uh, it was revealed, then learn it from Abdullah bin Masood. رَضِيَ اللَّهُ عَنْهُ So the Prophet ﷺ, he said to him, recite to me. So he said, should I recite to you and it's revealed to you? You're the one that it was revealed to, and I should recite to you, Allahu Akbar. Now, so he says, I like to hear it recited uh, from other than me. So Abdullah ibn Masud radiallahu anhu, he said, so I opened up the chapter of Anisa, I began reciting the, the chapter of Anisa. Now, until I reached the verse, فَكَيْفَ إِذَا جِئْنَا مِنْ كُلِّ أُمَّةٍ بِالشَّهِيدٍ وَجِئْنَا بِكَ عَلَى هَؤُلَاءِ شَهِيدًا So how about if we get if we bring on that day from every nation a witness and we bring you as a witness over all of them and we bring you as a witness over all of them so he said so i saw the, the eyes of the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam and, and there there he was crying meaning the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam he was he was listening this is our, the 41st verse so abdullah bin mas'ud he began reciting 41 verses they're not short verses several several pages Several pages. And whenever he got to this point, he seen that the Prophet Sallallahu from his contemplation and from his pondering over the words of Allah Azza wa Jal, that it affected his heart. And that it, tears came to his eyes. Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam until the extent he told Abdullah bin Mas'ud, this is enough. Hasbuk. It's enough. So this is the way of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And this is what his point here in mentioning this, that this is what he is advising and this is what he likes for that teacher, the one who sits to to teach the book of Allah Azza wa Jalla and he's hoping for the pleasure and the reward from Allah. He's hoping for the face of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, doing it sincerely for him alone and hoping for his pleasure, hoping for his reward, hoping for his paradise. Then he should do it in this manner. And he should take that prophet, that great noble prophet, the seal of all prophets, Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam as his role model in that. And then he should listen to his, his student attentively. Just as the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam listened to his student attentively. And in this manner, he may benefit. Just as the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he benefited. He heard the, recita the recitation of his student and it, it entered his heart. And it benefited him. Huh? And it increased him in khushu and humbleness before Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala. So the author, he says, Rahimahullah, وأحب لمن كان يقرئ ألا يدرس عليه وقت الدرس إلا واحد ولا يكون ثان معه فهو أنفع للجميع وأما التلقين فلا بأس أن يلقنا أن يلقنا الجماعة. He said, رحمه الله. Again mentioning some of those manners that he is preferring for that teacher for the مقرئ of the Quran. And I like for the one who is teaching the Qur'an that he should not have at one time more than one student studying with him. He should not, he does not like to have more than one student studying with him. He should not have two along with him. Meaning that if it's a, prior, if it's a, it's a class, he's learning like, for example, a specific portion. The student, he has a specific portion. And he is learning a specific part of the Qur'an or letters of the Qur'an or whatever the case may be. 
that he should like that he only has one student at this time. Not more than one student reciting different parts. This one's reciting Baqarah, this one is in just Amma, this one is here, and he's teaching all of them at the same time. He, he prefers not to do this. He says, Rahimahullah Ta'ala, because, because this is more beneficial for each one of them. Rather, he would give each one of his specific dars and his specific time and the specific attention. He said, as for if he's doing talqeen, what is talqeen? Yesterday we took talqeen. Laqqana yulaqinu, laqin, talqeenan. When he said, he recite, and he tell the, teach, the student to recite after him. And he repeat after me. Repeat after me. This is whenever the teacher, for example, he'll recite al istiada The students recite after him. He recite al basmila The student recite after him. He recite the first verse of Fatiha. He recite after him. Like this, back and forth. Repeat after me. He said, as for if the dars is like this, then there's no problem to do this with a congregation. There's no problem to do this in congregation. Naam, if, it, if it's teaching, if, and, and then he will let them repeat after him over and over until he is uh, aware that all of them uh, have pronounced the words properly and pronounced the, the letters properly and they have all memorized it properly. And this is particularly beneficial for the youth. And even sometimes this, I mean, talqeen, sometimes even a child that can't read, he can still learn the, the Quran from talqeen. You can tell him, repeat after me. So th- he's saying here that in this case, it's, it's no problem to have more than one student, to, re- to a- have a group of them in front of him and say, repeat after me. So he re- recite, and they all recite back to him at one time. And this is for the purpose of education. For the purpose of education. Now, he says, وَيَنْبَغِي لِمَنْ لِمَنْ قُرِيَ عَلَيْهِ الْقُرْآنِ فَأَخْطَأَ فِيهِ الْقَارِ أَوْ غَالِطَ now he says that likewise it's incumbent for the one or if uh, for whoever is reciting that if he makes a mistake, he's reciting the Qur'an and he makes a mistake. Now, the reciter, he's reciting, he makes an error. Maybe the words, he says the wrong words. Maybe he says the wrong harakah. Maybe he says the wrong makhraj. Whatever the case may be, this is the issue he's talking about. That he should not be harsh upon him. That he should not be harsh, he should not be stern. He should not be rude and in correcting him. If he made a mistake, he should not belittle him. If he shouldn't be harsh, then even more so, he should not belittle him. He should not belittle him. Naam, he said that he should be, huh? that he should be gentle with him. And he shouldn't, he shouldn't be harsh. He shouldn't be uh, rude. Naam, and more rifle that he should not belittle him. But rather, he will be. Gentle with him and correcting him. He won't let him stay on the mistake. He won't leave him in his mistake because that's not from Nasiha. That's not from Nasiha that he will leave him on his mistake. Rather, he will help him and correct him, but he would do that with gentleness and he would do that in a kind manner and he would do that patiently. He said, That he should be patient with him. He should be patient with him. He said, Because Most likely, if he is harsh to him, then he will flee. He will run away. He will run away. This is something the, the Muslims need to be aware of. Because unfortunately in many lands, it has been the opposite of this. The students, if they make a mistake, they get beat with a stick. Until the place that the, the child he hates more than anything is the dars. That he can't stand the dars. Even some of them, if he thinks of the, the book of Allah Azza wa Jal, he will have in his heart uh, a type of hateness, a hatred. Not for the book, because of the book, because every, his own his own experience, whenever that book is open, if he is not perfect, he's beaten. He's beaten. So the child shouldn't be beaten for the Quran. He didn't memorize the page. 
This is going to cause him to have this hatred in, in, in his heart. He's going to dislike it. Especially if he grows up upon that way. And whenever he's old enough to where he's by himself, maybe he's going to turn away. Whenever the child is young, the, 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 the father can, can, can help mold him. Can, can he nourish him and cultivate him. After he gets so old, that opportunity is gone. So if he cultivated him upon harshness, and even if the student didn't show anything, or the child didn't show anything, but in his heart, nobody likes to be beaten. And this puts a lot of pressure on the child. Every time he has to have it perfect and going to the teacher, the teacher he yells at him and he belittles him. Oh, you don't know anything or he'll slap him or strike him. Even if he doesn't touch him with his hands, but the tongue. They say sometimes sharper than words, sharper than a sword. And he maybe he'll, he'll belittle him or, or, or the life's like this. And this could cause his heart to turn away from the book of Allah. Cause his heart to turn away from the book of Allah. So this is not the way. The author is telling us if, he, if the student made a mistake, that he should not be harsh and that he should be gentle. He should not be rude. And we say from a more, more rightful, he should not belittle him. He should not belittle him. You don't know nothing. Like that, you don't talk like this. Nam to the student. Shouldn't, and, and also likewise, I and mean, this is a benefit for the parents, we shouldn't talk like that to our children either. You don't know nothing. And he would rather, that's destruction. That's called the Hedim. And he, to destroy his, his, his personality and to destroy his mind and his, his self-respect. But rather you should cultivate him. To cultivate him and to, to redirect him. And to advise him in the good manner, in the good way. To remind him of Allah Azza wa Jal. Remind him of the hereafter and the likes like this. But not to belittle him. You can't do anything right. If he keeps hearing this, he's going to believe that. That's not the way that a believer will raise his, his children. Rather, the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam he was mentioned by Anas ibn Malik, and he lived with the Prophet for, for his whole time in Medina. Radiallahu anhu, and he was a young boy, and he said that you know sometimes my I didn't do everything I was supposed to do. He said the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam he never once told me why didn't I do this. The Prophet he never told me he never told me one time why didn't you do this. And one time he, he left to do something for the Prophet ﷺ. He went and he seen the boys playing. He stopped and he played. After it took some time, the Prophet ﷺ came and found him. And sent him on his way. But he never told him. He never was harsh to him. Why didn't you do this? Why didn't you do that? Uh, this is the way. The Prophet ﷺ, he taught in the best manner. He taught in the, in the best manner. So this is the way of a, of a teacher. Of the Quran. Specifically, likewise, of a parent. And in general. And somebody who has a guardian, and somebody who's a guardian has somebody under his care. Sometimes some students or some children, and in general, one thing we mentions she would be she youth or some kids they, huh? The kindness doesn't work for them. They take they say you give them an inch, it takes a mile. Some sometimes there has to be harshness, but that's not the origin in education. That's not the origin in the cultivation. In any case, it wouldn't be because of the Quran. Because of the Quran, if they talk back or if they disrespect the parents or they do something that is haram, learning the Quran is not an obligation. Learning the Quran is not an obligation. It's preferred. So, but if they do something that is haram, they, sometimes if, they, if they're being kind and teaching them in the best manner doesn't work, then there's other issues and ways to deal with that. But here in general, the case is this. The author, he is saying that he should not be harsh. That rather he should be kind and gentle with him. And with his student, he should not be rude to him. And he should be patient with him. Now he said because uh, most likely that he is going to turn away. And he will probably not come back to the masjid. He will probably not come back to the masjid. And he won't want to come back. Maybe his parents might make him come back. And now in his heart he doesn't want to be there. So now he has an issue with learning the Quran. In his heart. He doesn't like it. But on the other hand, if the, if the teacher shows him kindness and gentleness... He makes a mistake if he's oh and he's afraid that something's gonna happen. Then he finds that the teacher was nice to him, kind to him. Don't worry about it. But he but he correct him in the best manner, in the best way. Then he will have a connection with his teacher, and he will see that this te that his teacher I I is kind, and that his teacher is nice, and that his teacher wants good for him, and he's trying to help him, and that he's patient with him. So then he'll build a, rela a relationship with that teacher, and then he will love to learn from him. He will love to learn from him. And he will not be afraid of him. 
Likewise, the, 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 the child, he will love to learn from the... He, maybe he know he did something wrong, he'll be afraid, he'll be as afraid. But in the end, yani the, if you treat him in the best manner, it, it's, it's, it's the best way. It's the best way. As for harshness, whenever this comes into a situation, then it, it corrupts it. This is the way the Prophet wasallam. Many narrations, the Prophet wasallam. for example, he said, إِنَّ رِفْقَ لَا يَكُونُ فِي شَيْءٍ إِلَّا Zana, wala yunza'u min shayin illa shana. That gentleness is not used in any situation except for it beautifies it, it makes it better. And it's not taken out of any situation except for it brings deficiency. It brings deficiency. So this is the way of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, likewise he mentioned, man yuhamu rifqa, yuhamu khayra kulla. That whoever is prohibited from having gentleness, then he is prohibited from all good. He's prohibited from all good. He's prohibited from all good. There's many, many narrations about this. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he dealt with the people gently. And because of this, many people accepted the da'wah and entered into Islam. His enemies became his closest friends and companions, ready to give their life for him. Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So he says, likewise, he says, وَقَدْ رُوِيَ عَنِ النَّبِي Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam أَنَّهُ قَالْ أنه قال علموا ولا تعنفوا فإن المعلم خير من المعنف وقال صلى الله عليه وسلم إنما بعثتم ميسرين ولم تبعثوا معسرين. He mentioned that it has been narrated from the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم. He said that you should teach the people. You should not be harsh. Teach, teach, educate, and don't be harsh, because verily the teacher he is much better than the one who is harsh. He is much better than the one who is harsh. He said, and likewise, he mentioned the, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. He said that you are only sent to be people muyassirin, making it easy for the people. You are not sent to make it hard on the people. And whenever he would send his messengers and he would send people out to call their tribes and the likes, he would tell them like this in this manner, to, to make it easy for the people and to not make it hard on the people. Make it easy for the people, meaning in the, in the limits of the legislation. And the limits of the, leg- of the legislation. Some people, they take this wrong and they say, make it easy for the people. So they pray one prayer a day, two prayers a day. Well, he prays Fajr whenever he gets up before work at nine o'clock in the morning, for example. Now the deen is easy. The Prophet said, make it easy for the people. La, that's not the proper understanding of the narration. Make it easy with inside the limits. Make it easy with inside the limits. Like whenever there's uh, room for ease because of difficulty, then teach them this. If they're traveling and it's difficult, then they can break their fast. It's an obligation to pray, but if you can't stand, then you can sit. If it's, a, it's an obligation to use water for wudu, but if you can't, you can make the yamum. If he's sick, for example, even if the water is present and he is present and he is in his in his land, he's not traveling. But it's is it's harmful for him. He can make the yamum like this. So make it easy for the people. Meaning in the, in the limits of the legislation. And the limits of the legislation. Likewise, if there's two difficulty, difficult affairs occurring or, or, or there, there could be two uh, harms at one time to do one or the other, that it's permissible for him to, to, to do the lesser harm. And the example is that uh, desert Arab that came to the Prophet's masjid, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, akramakum Allah jameen, and he passed urine in one of the corners of the masjid. And this is an example of the kindness of the Prophet in dealing with the ignorant person and how to teach him. The companions, they jumped up and hastened. They want to... They want to uh, you know, to harm him and to, to stop him and prohibit it, the Prophet said, no, leave him. To leave him and let him finish. And then they told him to pour the water over there. So this is from the ease and the deen. First, he's teaching him in the best manner because he doesn't know. So he should not be dealt with in a harsh way because he's ignorant. He doesn't know the virtue of the masjid, the rulings of the masjid, and the likes like that. And then on top of that, which is worse, for him to pass urine in one, in one spot or to in many spots? And it's worse to have it to go in many spots or maybe all over himself or even maybe on them. Likewise. So the Prophet ﷺ, he chose out of these two different, either it's going, to, it's going to go in one spot, it's going to go all over the place. So let it go in one spot. This is from the ease. This is the intent of the Prophet ﷺ, that the deen has ease in it. And in, in, in situations like this, not making something haram and permissible. Without any difficulty He's lazy He doesn't want to get up and pray Or it's too hot this year So we'll make Ramadan later He makes it up 
and, it, and with the claim that there's ease in the religion. That, that's not the case. That's not the case. But definitely the deen, it has ease. It, it has ease. It has ease. And this is by abiding by the restrictions and the regulations, by the ahkam. Naam? So the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he mentioned this. Here he had, the author, he mentioned a narration with his chain to Abi Huraira radiallahu anhu about this. The Prophet sallallahu he said, Alimu wa la tu'annifu fa inna al-mu'allima khayru min al-mu'annif. And in the same thing the author, he mentioned previously. But this narration is weak. Actually the narration is weak. But the next narration the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he mentioned, or excuse me, the author, rahimahullah, he mentioned with his chain to Anas ibn Malik radiallahu anhu that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he said, Yasiru wa la tu'asiru wa sakinu wa la tu'nafiru. That this is authentic narration in Bukhari. This is authentic narration in Sahih Bukhari that the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam he would say to them, make things easy for the people, and not make make things make things hard for them. Make it easy for them, any meaning inside the limits of the legislation, and do not make it difficult for them, and do not make something that is not obligatory obligatory for them. For example, if it's hard for them to pray. Or it's difficult for them to pray, then command them and, and, and command them to pray the obligatory prayer. But do not command, but do not command them to pray the not to pray the non-obligatory prayer. If it's difficult for this person, for example, if they're new in Islam, make it easy for them. And let them suffice with the obligation. Don't make them pray the, 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 the twelve rakah on top of that. Don't force them to get up in the middle of the night to pray the night prayer. And he can barely even pray that he's learning the five daily prayer. Make it easy for him. Let him learn the deen and that which is obligatory first and then teach him later that which is preferred. So make it easy for him and don't make it hard for him. Don't make it hard for him, meaning making him do something that's not obligatory for him whenever it's difficult. And, he, and because the person who makes it easy, then he'll bring sakina. So this is an and he, to reinforce the idea. And he, because if he made it easy for him, he'll bring calmness to his heart. وَلَا تُعَسِّرُوا uh, Meaning also وَلَا تُنَفِّرُوا And he, because if you make it hard for them, he's going to turn them away. So then be gentle with them, be kind with them, and make it easy for them. By helping them to fulfill the commandments and the requirements that is incumbent upon them first. And not overburdening them with extra, with extra actions that's not obligatory. If he sees from them that after that they're learning and a person he's able to do more, then at this time he would encourage him. Still within the limits, not overburdening them, not overburdening them. The way of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam with ibadah and with worship is moderate, is moderation, is moderation. That a person he would uh, choose from those non-obligatory deeds that which the amount that he's able to continue with, that, that the amount that he's able to continue with. As for the obligatory deeds, then a person, a believer, he has no choice. He has to perform them. They're obligatory. But as for the non-obligatory deeds, then he will select that which he can continue. From the night prayer or from the memorization of the Quran. He won't try to memorize, for example, yes, siru wala tu asiru. Make it easy for them. So, what would he do? He will ask the student to memorize, for example, if he can read good and fluently, memorize three lines. He won't tell him, memorize one page a day in the very beginning, one page a day. This is making it hard for him. Maybe he can even do it. Some students can do it, even those who can do it, maybe it's not so beneficial in the beginning to have them in this manner, to do it in this manner. Because maybe you'll continue one day, two days, three days, after that it's heavy and he'll leave it entirely. But as for if he directed him, according to the narration, yes, you make it easy for him. Just bring me three verses. Just bring me three verses in the next class. And then the next the three, like this, and continue until he's fluent on this and then add half page. Then a page like this, but as for making it hard on him in the very beginning, this is not from the way of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Rather, the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam he said, "Yes, you will to asiru." Because if he made made him do that much in a whole page, for example, in the beginning, what's going to happen? He's not going to have sakina. <laughs> he's he's going to become more uh, It's going to be hard. He's going to be apparent. It's going to be difficult for him. He's going to have pressure on him, and then eventually, he's not going to be able to fulfill that. So what is he going to do? Yenfur. He's going to leave. So the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he said to be gentle. And he said, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, to be, make it easy and not make it hard. Because if you make it easy, then you will bring tranquility to the student and to the people that you're calling. And likewise, they will not flee from you. But the one who brings is harsh and he makes it difficult for them, they're going to turn away. They're going to, to turn away. 
The author, he mentioned another narration, this time with his chain, to Umar ibn al-Khattabi radiyallahu anhu, that he said, ta'allamu al-ilm, ta'allamu al-ilm, wa ta'allamu lil-ilmi s-sakinata wal-hilm, wa tawadau liman tu'allimun, wa li tawadau lakum man tu'allimun, wa la takunu jababirat al-ulama, fa la yakumu ilmukum bi jahlikum. He mentioned this narration from Umar radiyallahu anhu that he said learn the knowledge and learn the no- and learn along with that knowledge tranquility and patience forbearance hilm not to not be hasty so learn the knowledge and also learn how to use and apply the knowledge so he says learn the knowledge ta'allamu al-ilm wa ta'allamu lil-ilmi as-sakina wal-hilm so learn the knowledge, but at the same time, with that knowledge, learn patience, learn forbearance, learn how to be calm, learn how to have honor in your dealings, and have uh, sakina, tranquility in the manners that a person that he would speak in the conduct, conduct himself with honor, with hilm, he wouldn't hasten and be harsh. And he said, and be humble to those whom you teach. Be humble to those whom you teach. And let those whom... You, Learn from you, likewise, uh, be humble to you. So he says, be humble to those who you are teaching and let those who are learning from you or those who you are teaching, let them likewise be humble to, to you. So this is a tawjih, what is shad from Umar radiallahu anhu that the teacher, he must be humble to his students and that the students likewise must be humble to their teachers, to their teachers. Now, فالعلم ورحم بين أهلي that they're all connected together. And if they're all connected, this knowledge is, is like a womb for them. They're, they're all related by way of this knowledge. They all have a relationship through this knowledge. So let them all deal with each other in the best manner. He said, وَلَا تَكُونُوا جَبَابِرَةِ الْعُلَمَاءِ And do not be those arrogant. Do not be those arrogant scholars. جَبَابِرَةِ the arrogant and the jabbar. What's that word mean? The ruler who is like that. I forget the word. Tyrant. Somebody said, huh? Tyrant. Do not be tyrant scholars. Jababiratul ulama. Zakamullah khairan. Do not be tyrant scholars. The words come together. And he's a scholar, but he's a tyrant. And he's arrogant, proud, thinking he's better. He said, Don't, do not be like this. Because your knowledge will not be, be spread because of your ignorance. And if a person, he acts in an ignorant manner, in an ignorant way, his knowledge is not going to be spread. And the ilm is not going to be established uh, by way of ignorant manners and conduct. But rather, it will be spread by those good, noble manners and the noble conduct. The author, he says, قال محمد بن حسين رحمه الله فمن كانت هذه أخلاقه انتفع به من يقرأ عليه The one who has these manners, then whoever reads to him will benefit from him. And he meaning this person who follows this, this etiquette that he is indicating here, that his students will benefit from him. His students will benefit from him. ثم أقول إنه ينبغي لمن كان يقرأ القرآن لله جلت عظمته أن يسون نفسه عن الاستق عن استقضاء الحوائج ممن يقرأ عليه القرآن ولا يستخدمه ولا يكلفه حاجة يقوم فيها. He said رحمه الله تعالى he said and likewise I say ثم أقول and then I say after all of this that it is incumbent upon him that he the one who is reading or teaching excuse me the Quran for the sake of Allah عز وجل alone that he must protect himself. From using the Quran to take care of his own personal needs, and from the one who is reading from him, and he meaning he says, "Wala yastakhdimahu," that he should not use his, he should not use his uh, students. Now, nah. "Wala yastakhdimahu," that he should not use his students. Jazakallah khair. Nam. وَأَنْ لَا يَسْتَخْدِمُهُ نعم وَأَنْ لَا يعني that he should not use his his students يعني for his personal benefits use them to take care of his needs 
use him to take care of his personal personal uh, affairs and the likes like this. He says, "Wala yukallifahu hajatan yakumu fiha," and that he should not uh, give his students some personal need that he needs to be taken care of, and he should have him take care of that for him. He said, "Waqtar Allahu ida arabat lahu hajatun al an yukallifaha liman la yakrau alaihi." He said, and likewise that. If uh, he is some need occurs to him, meaning that he ha- he actually does have a need is presented to him, then he should uh, let someone who does not learn from him take care of it for him. He should let someone who is not reading to him, meaning somebody who has not learned from him, he should be the one who takes care of that for him. He should not give that require that job for his personal assistance to a student of his. So he says, رحمه الله تعالى ثم أقول إنه ينبغي لمن كان يقرأ القرآن لله جلت عظمته أن يسون نفسه عن استقضاء الحوائج ممن يقرأ عليه القرآن ولا يستخدمه ولا يكلفه حاجة يقوم فيها واختار الله إذا عرضت له حاجة أن يكلفها لمن لا يقرأ عليه وحب له أن يسون القرآن أن أن تقض أن تقضى له به الحوائج، فإن عرضت له حاجة سأل مولاه الكريم قضاها. He said رحمه الله تعالى he says now I say that it is incumbent upon the one who is teaching the Quran for the sake of Allah عز وجل that he protect himself from seeking uh, to from having his needs taken care of from those who learn from him, from those who read the Quran to him, that he should not use them. And that he should not uh, burden them with any need that they should do for his own personal affair, from his personal needs. And I choose for him that if some need uh, was presented to him, and he has some need that he needs to take care of, that he should give that, or, or he should uh, allow the one who does not read to him to take care of that. He should not give that burden to one who reads and learns from him. Rather, if there's a, he needs somebody to take care of some of his needs, it should be from someone other than than his students. From other than his students, he said, "وَحِبُّ لَهُ أَنْ يَسُونَ الْقُرْآنَ عَنْ أَنْ تُقْضَى لَهُ بِهِ الْحَوَائِجِ." And he said, "And I like that he should protect the Quran and keep it safe from being used as a means for his needs to be taken care of and for de- for for needs to be taken care of." He said, and if some need was presented, then he should ask his noble lord to take care of it for him. Then he should ask his noble lord to take care of it for him. He said, فَإِذَا بْتَدَأَهُ أَحَدٌ مِنْ إِخْوَانِهِ مِنْ غَيْرِ مَسْأَلَةٍ فَخَضَاهَا فَخَضَاهَا لَهُ الشَّخَرَ اللَّهَ عَزَّ وَجَلْ إِذَا إِذْ صَانَهُ عَنِ الْمَسْأَلَةِ وَتَذَلُّلِ لِأَهْلِ الدُّنْيَا وَإِذْ سَهَرَ الله له قضاها ثم يشكر لمن أجري ذلك على يديه فإن هذا واجب عليه. He said so if someone were to take care of his need from his brothers and he without him asking and he took care of it then what should he do? Now, first he doesn't ask the people he asks Allah Azza wa Jal. He asks Allah Azza wa Jal. Then if someone came and took care of his need for him from his brothers without him asking them. And took care of that, then he should thank Allah Azza wa Jal. Then he should thank Allah Azza wa Jal because Allah had protected him from lowering himself uh, and humiliating himself in front of the people of the dunya by begging them. And because Allah Azza wa Jal had made it easy for him to take care of his need. And then after that, he should show thanks and uh, appreciation to the one who, uh, who had taken care of this for him, who this blessing had occurred at his hand, because this is something that is obligatory upon him. And in the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he said, Man lam yashkur al-nas, lam yashkur Allah. That whoever did not show thanks to the people, that he did not show thanks to Allah. But first he would show thanks to Allah azza wa jal. Because it is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala who had directed that person to him, to take care of his need for him. It is Allah azza wa jal that had given that person the ability and had given that person the wealth. Likewise, who had provided that for him. Subhanahu wa ta'ala. So first he would thank his Lord. He would thank him. He said here, for having his need met, and for having his need uh, to be taken care of, and likewise he would thank Allah Azza wa Jal because he did not have to belittle himself and to ask. He did not have to belittle himself in front of the people of the dunya and ask them for help. Rather, it was taken care of without doing this. Allah Subhanahu wa Taala took care of his need and also saved him from belittlement and from begging the people. And this is two favors. 
So he will thank Allah Azza wa Jal for this, for making this easy and facilitating his need to be taken care of. And likewise, after that, he will also thank that person. He will also show thanks to that individual because verily the one who did not thank the people, then he did not thank uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He did not thank Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He said, وَقَدْ رُوِيَتْ فِيمَا ذَكَرْتُ أَخْبَارٌ تَدُلُوا عَلَى مَا قُلْتُ وَنَا أَذْكُرُهَا لِيَزْدَادَ الْنَاظِرُ فِي كِتَابِنَا بَصِيرَةً إِنشَاءَ He said, and there have been narrations that indicate what I have mentioned. There have been, there are, there have been narrated narrations that indicate what I have mentioned, and I will mention some of them now, so that the one who looks into our book, he will increase in insight and understanding, insha'Allah. So he mentioned this time with a chain of narration to Abdullah ibn Idris. He said, فَلَمَّا كُنْتُ قَالَ لِي uh, uh, Excuse me, he did to uh, Al-Hasan ibn Rabi' Al-Burani. He said that I was with Abdullah ibn Idris. He said, فَلَمَّا كُنْتُ قَالَ لِي سَلْ أَنْ سِيرِ أُشْنَانِ he asked about the price of Ushnan. فَلَمَّا مَا شَيْتُ رَدَّنِي فَقَالَ لِي لَا تَسْأَلْ فَإِنَّكَ تَكْتُبُ مِنِّي الْحَدِيثِ وَأَنَا أَقْرَهُ أَنْ أَسْأَلَ مَنْ يَسْمَعُ مِنِّي الْحَدِيثِ حَاجَةً He said that he told him, Al-Hasr ibn Rabi' he told Abdullah ibn Idris. He said whenever he got up, ask for the price of this Ushnan. Ushnan is a type of uh, a plant that they use for cleansing, for cleansing. He said, whenever, so he said, whenever I walked away, and his teacher told him to ask for the price of something in the market. And then whenever he walked away, he told him to come back. And he said, wait, don't ask. Verity, you, you write narrations. You take narrations from me. And I dislike for those who hear from me narrations to take care of any of my needs. Subhanakallahumma bihamdika shadu wa la ilaha illa anta astaghfiru wa atubu ilayhi.